Okay, um, we're live on YouTube, I think. We're live on Zoom. Welcome everyone to the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh. Um, this is our AGM night, but um, to start with, we have a talk. So we've got um, Jim Patterson here, who's come all the way from Moffat to talk to us about their observatory and the Dark Sky Award. Um, just a, a few introductory remarks. I'll tell you what's coming up soon. Um, Nigel's going to be covering the sky in June, and then um, we'll be turning off YouTube at that point, and um, we'll be having our AGM. And Sean promises me he'll be here by then. And if he's not doing, then we can all go home. Not there. Uh, we have a new member, uh, Richard Shaw. Is Richard here? Yes. Nope. Wherever he is, anyway. Okay. And we've Memberships jumped to 171, and if you want to join us, the rates are very reasonable. And if you want to stay in touch with us, then lots of ways of doing that on our website, Facebook, um, Twitter, and all the um, recordings of our meetings over the last couple of years are also on our YouTube channel, and there's some pretty amazing things on there, I think. This is what we've got coming up, um, our imaging and observing group on Wednesday for members only. And on the 17th of July, Dr. Natalie Starkey is going to be telling us about volcanoes of the solar system. Um, our 1st of July a meeting is going to be a members night again. Um, so there'll be a, a, a lot of um, short presentations from members. Um, so if you have something you want to talk about, then um, let me know and we'll fit you in somewhere. And the 15th of July, uh, the last uh, meeting before our August break is um, the First Light Optics Observatory, the Icarus Observatory, and um, it's a remote observatory in Spain. You may have followed it on Stargazers Lounge. That should be really interesting, I think. And then we have our August break, and we have we have loads of talks lined up. Nigel and, and the team have been doing an amazing job. I think we've got talks all the way into well into next year now, but um, those are the things that um, are coming up after August. Um, that's really it for me, Jim. And it's over to you, please. So there'll be a Slight break while we swap over laptops. Thanks, Mark, and good evening, all. Uh, perhaps I could introduce myself as being um, a lighting engineer and not an astronomer and not a physicist, and not a scientist. So this presentation is going to be based on engineering concepts, I think. I think you'll recognize that um, uh, astronomy isn't my strong point. <laughs> but I, 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 I'm a light, so I'm a lighting engineer who've been knocking holes in dark streets and dark towns for the last 50 years. Uh, and as a semi-retired engineer, I returned to Scotland from a life of nearly 40 years in the urban conurbation of West Midlands. I had almost forgotten what starry skies looked like, but I discovered a new outlet for writing lighting master plans. Well, lighting master plans in my previous life was trying to get local authorities to put a master plan together on how they should be managing the lighting system. And I can tell you, I only got one local authority who listened to us and we wrote them a lighting master plan. But the new master plans came in a different form. As a retired local authority lighting engineer in 1993, I retired on early pension to start up my own lighting design consultancy in Coventry. And my partner and I were instrumental in preparing obtrusive lighting guides, fairly comprehensive one, which Bob Misson from the Campaign for Dark Sky reminded me that we had provided him with quite a, 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 a well put together CD of how to deal with obtrusive light. But when I returned to Scotland, I really wanted to look for lighting design work. I said to my partner in England, you look after England. I'm going back to Scotland to develop some more clients. And if I don't get any clients, that's me retired. 
So that would have been my second retirement. Astronomy for me was furthest from my mind, as I've said. And I got a complete surprise when I got an early call from the Forestry Commission. The last people in that that I thought would need a lighting engineer. Uh, and at our first meeting, they explained to me that they wanted to do a dark sky park in conjunction with the International Dark Sky Association. So they explained the plan, they explained they were going to try and attract winter tourism to the area. And they provided me with the Dark Sky guidelines, which the Dark Sky Association had put together, together with a couple of applications which had been made in America. Well, it may come as no surprise to you, but I had great difficulty in cutting through Americanism. Um, someone asked me some time ago, what's the hardest part you've done as far as dark sky work is concerned? And I said, talking to America. However, um, you might get a surprise as well when I say I got inspiration from a church service. Um, the visiting minister at the time went through the children's address and then got to the point where he introduced the first hymn. Uh, and all of a sudden I sat up, when he got to the last lines, it's, he said, you in your small corner and I in mine. Oh, great. <laughs> this is how I've got to start. I recognized one word, and that was lumens. I knew what lumens were, so I had to sit in that corner, jump to another corner and try and understand the jargon and things that they put together, uh, and then into another corner and understand that, and then put the various corners together as a cohesive exercise. Well, the Dark Sky Master Plans I now had to write was not just based on street lighting, which had been my uh, earlier uh, forte, it had to encompass exterior lighting in domestic property and exterior lighting in commercial property as well, all built in within one large project. And this was, as well as being a first for Galloway Forest Park, this was a first for me as well. It was a refreshing exercise as far as technicalities were concerned. Here was a global opportunity to look at lighting as a holistic pattern. And after writing my first draft for Galloway Forest, I remember the manager saying to me, Jim, you've written this with a great deal of passion. Now can we change thou shalt not to something like could or should or may to, as a recommendation rather than a regulation. So uh, you can see the effort, the whole heart and soul that I'd put in it was obviously uh, reflected in his impression that I'd made it with a great deal of passion. Um, and I'll come back to the regulation in a minute. But the seeds for Moffat project started as a challenging throwaway statement. The Moffat Forum asked me uh, perhaps about four or five dark sky aspects later on to come and talk to them about some of the work that I'd been doing in the likes of uh, um, Galloway Forest and, and the national parks in Wales and also a national park here in the Tr Trussocks. And um, Moffat has a population of about 2,500 and it's surrounded by hills and miles from the lighting pollution that occurs in the central belt here in Scotland. So in the closing lines, I said that I'd actually like to bring a dark sky status to Moffat as a town. But I did express my dismay in the fact that it may be a bridge too far for the local authority to cough up some money to change all the low pressure sodium streetlights to downward pointing LED lights. Perhaps it was the wrong audience to throw away a statement to. Uh, so I, in a few days afterwards, I phoned up the lighting engineer in Dumfries and Galloway Council, and I gave him my throwaway mustard seed uh, in a telephone conversation. 
And of course, I got the answer, no money reply that I expected. But it was nearly 12 months later, and it came as an absolute surprise to me that he had found the Scottish government willing to give a grant for an energy saving case study. Super, he said, could we join your light? Could we join your, uh, make it a double, a, double, a double win? As well as saving energy, I think we could save the sky at the same time. And I thought, great. So we put together a win-win objective and they got the grant. At that time, that was 2011, the IDA guidelines for dark sky communities was written on two sides of an A4 sheet, in complete contrast to the guidelines that had provided, which amounted to about 11 or 12 pages for a dark sky park or a dark sky reserve. Uh, there's going to be nothing simple. This is dead simple in comparison to the work that I'd been working on. Simple. I put six months' time on this. Well, um, it started. We got the award and it started. Uh, but because it was going to use LED lighting, um, at this stage in 2011, LED lighting was in its fairly early stages of development. And there was no time to try and trial it because I'd put six months on a, a project project timescale, there was no time to do experiments. But it was just about this time, and I think I'm correct in saying Edinburgh started doing what I should have been doing as experiments. In three areas in Edinburgh, they introduced white light to the sodium areas, but they did it as a public participation process and they got public feedback. There was no time for me to do that. So all I had to do was to get out the computer and do a desktop, desktop study. And I put together a desktop study which was based on guideline, a baseline study on what is the low pressure sodium providing us with. And you'll see that uh, I've got, a, the first column was the baseline. What values are we getting out of the low pressure sodium in three or four different streets? I've condensed this table. Uh, uh, it was much fuller than uh, I can show here. But um, as well as doing road, in, as well as looking at the road performance, I looked at garden performance, how much light was traveling behind the fittings, as far as gardens were concerned, and importantly, how much light was going on the face of the building. All wasted light, really, in terms of um, uh, the, the fittings are there to light the streets, they're not there to light buildings. And that was my thinking anyway. Um, and the top line is the average, top line on this table is the average illumination on the road. And out of all the fittings that we tested, there wasn't too much variation in average illumination. But there was one fitting that stood out a mile uh, and that was the Phillips fitting, which gave a uniformity much better than everything else. So I thought, this is the fitting to use. Um, just a little bit of uh, uh, lighting here. It's not the amount of light that you put on the road. It's the uniformity that makes it good. If you get better uniformity, you've got a better visual impression of the illumination of the, illumination of the road. So we picked that one. And down at the bottom, you'll see upward light from the sodium light with something like 7% wasted light. And there is 0% from the LED fittings. Oh, incidentally, before we move on to the next one, look at the light on the house front. Five, nearly six lux maximum. And that could be going through someone's bedroom window. I didn't actually plot the house front. I just look for the maximum value. It could be going through a house window and uh, the minimum value 0.19. Just look at how much light we've saved cutting down that. And we got one complaint. I'm jumping ahead. We got one complaint after it had started. Someone couldn't find their way to their toilet 
because they needed to switch the light on in the house. They were able to do it without switching the lights on before. There we are. So the before and after, there's a couple of befores and after for you. Uh, you'll see that the light, the top one is the sodium lighting, the bottom picture is afterwards. And you can see that there's, hopefully, I'm not so sure you're seeing too well on this screen, but I can see better over here. Um, uh, there is much less light on the chimney pots. So it's down on the road where it's needed. Top one is the sodium, and you'll see glare from sodium and no glare from the LED white light. A mainish type road, top one sodium, bottom one, look at the uniformity, much, looks much better. But more importantly, what's the impact looking into Moffat? Well, top one is Moffat with, high, with low pressure sodium lighting, bottom one, glare obtrusion is gone. By the way, um, Moffat, I don't know if you know the Devil's Beef Tub Road. It's a tourist route from Edinburgh into Moffat. goes downhill. Everyone that spoken to me said, the yellow dome is gone. Super, we can't see where Moffat is anymore coming down that road. Perfect. And also from uh, the back garden in Moffat, you can see the Milky Way. Well, while these exercises were going, while the development was going on, I did a survey of all the domestic units and a survey of all the commercial units to work out the compliance rate, whether they were within what the IDA were calling dark sky friendly exercise uh, and worked out a percentage of compliant fittings against those that weren't compliant. And everything was finished within my six month time scale. As far as installation was concerned, application was written, the master plan was written, not only for Moffat, but also for the complete Galloway, Dumfries and Galloway Council. Because at that time I had heard other towns might want to join in. So here was the opportunity to do a master plan for the county so that other towns could follow suit. Well, to this day, I don't know why our application wasn't read at the time by the Dark Sky Association. I know that we put it in at the same time as the Island of Call and the Northumberland National Park, which I'd also been working on. So I knew the time scale they were working with. I knew theirs had gone in but ours wasn't read and those two got awards well before the Moffat application was read. Well, six months to about a year later, not only had the Dark Sky rules changed, but the personalities had changed. The manager was different. He had his own ideas, his own expectations. And I got a letter back to say, that the plan was perceived as being far too technical. And I hadn't engaged with enough supporters, which was true. I, I had driven it. Um, I, I didn't have an astronomy club to go back to. There was no astronomy club. I was there with an idea and it was... But I should say at this time, my second edition Interestingly enough, the second edition, I wanted to increase the supporters. So I got a hold of the science or physics teacher at Moffat Academy. And I said, could I have one or two letters from your students as supporting a dark sky astronomy type exercise? Oh yes, that's fine. I was expecting two or three, maybe six. I would have been really happy if I'd got six and 12 would have been over the moon. Well, I got 24 letters back. 
interestingly enough as well, uh, Nigel, speaking to Nigel earlier, and I said I, I was trying to finish off a dark sky application for the island of St. Helena. You know, we've got 130 letters of support for St. Helena. Guess how many students have put their names to that? 90. You know, education and the dark sky work is working a lot better than the tourism, I think. However, and I think your honorary president is working down those lines. Catherine Hamans is desperate to get into schools. So in addition to addressing other technical issues because of the change in the guidelines, it took a further 55 emails and about 18 months just to get Dumfries and Galloway to the point at which they could write some words which the IDA looked at as being legal because one of the other things that they said in their ob objection to our first application was, it has to be a legal document. And that was a real stumbling block. Technical issues I could deal with, but nothing in lighting is legal. Uh, so this was um, a, a real step backwards to what I'd written for Galloway Forest. They turned it into a, a recommendation, which I could go along with. We're now back to looking at something that was a regulation. So um, the award eventually came after five years of work. And we had our star party on the 22nd of November, 2016. And for those of you who are into astrology and not astronomy, uh, we'll recognize the fact that the 30th, the 22nd of March is round about the rising of Aries. Aries being the ram, the ram in the sky rising zodiac on the 22nd. And why have I chosen that date? Because those of you who know Moffat will know there's a huge fountain in the middle of it. And at the top of the fountain, an even larger ram. So that was uh, uh, combining not only the first dark sky community outside America, but a first with the zodiac. During that star party, I was asked if that was the end of the story. And I said, it might be for me as the engineer, but it's the start of a new chapter for. Moffat. And from that conversation started the Astronomy Club. And it was fairly early on, it produced, it bought a six inch go to telescope on a tripod. And you know, um, setting it up on really cold winter's nights, really lost members. They got fed up waiting on it, being aligned, setting it up correctly, getting it aligned. Uh, and, and I think we lost about four or five members. We had quite a good, I think we had about 20 members to start with. I noticed this in your board here, it, you've got 170. And I said to Nigel, oh, we've got only 15. Uh, uh, it's important to try and keep your, once you've got your membership, try and keep them. And from that exercise, the club, developed the thoughts that perhaps we should be looking at something a little bit more substantial. Somewhere that was permanently erected as a telescope permanently erected, somewhere to keep the wind away from. Uh, and this is the, the picture here was the original concept of two domes, two telescopes. Uh, but even at that, they said, you know, Freeze a crowd in a, a dome like this, and that still leaves people outside. Perhaps we should be making a meeting room as part of it. Um, let's try cutting one of the telescope. We, 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 let's try cutting the telescope down a bit. Well, fine, we'll make a meeting room, but where's the money coming from? Well, the club made an application to Scottish and Southern Energy, who were giving 
community payback money um, because the streets of Moffat had been used to transmit some of the turbine work from the motorway to a wind farm, which was completely out of sight of Moffat. And we got somewhere in the region of 34,000 pounds. And from that, there was just massive brainstorming in where to go next, what to do. One telescope, two telescopes, what's the size of the telescope? And everyone in the, in the, in the committee had a completely different picture and the events just went outwards completely. But by this time, uh, the original concept was in the Golf Club Hill. By this time, the Golf Club committee had changed and they then saw a construction, which is something like this, or maybe even larger, obstructing their view of the Moffat Hills. Perhaps we should be looking somewhere else. And um, when it got to the stage, they said, well, maybe we could give you a piece of land somewhere else and it will cost you £3,000 a year rent. And we said, we'll go somewhere else. So I, we looked somewhere else, but it took two years to do that. Two years and seven other locations, trying to find a reasonable horizon, the view of a reasonable horizon, trying to get easy access to it. And uh, it almost became an impossible task. But the chair of the time just happened to be in the right place at the right time to meet a non-dom Moffatonian who was visiting Moffat. So, and he was a receptive landlord. He listened to what she said. We had already tried to be uh, into the school. We'd already tried to get into the school grounds, but that wasn't um, a starter. But he had land close to the school, which he was willing to rent to us for a minimum of a, min, a minimal sum of a pound a year. Right, let's let's have it. Um, and it's within a 20 minute walk of the town, if you wanted to walk. It's got a little car park and it's next door to Moffat Academy. So there's a link between a possible community telescope here and the school itself without being in the school grounds. And it's also got a reasonably good view of the horizon. So the basic concept was now a viewing area, a three by three, do a, a three meter, a three meter uh, diameter dome uh, built on half of a summer house and the rest of the uh, uh, this construction, a whole size summer, five meters by three meters summer house turned into a warm room. So we abandoned the idea of two telescopes at this point in time, because money was running out. Um, and we'll come back, to, we'll keep coming back to money. Um, money was running out. Uh, uh, we went to a local builder and he said, oh, it will cost you £10,000 just to do about a three by three construction work to put your dome on the top of. Uh, so we, said, well, we might find something else. And I uh, got the idea of the summer houses from a visit to Dobie's, which is just on the outskirts of Edinburgh here. Um, I saw the idea of doing planks. It's really like a log cabin with planks interlocking. Idea, ideal to stop building at a particular time and put the dome in the top rather than go to the complete construction of a semi-prefabricated wall. So a redundant version of AutoCAD came out and we put in a planning application, uh, which took about three months to get through. So we got the planning application, we ordered the material. Well, just as the material was about to be delivered from, I, I didn't, I, I went to uh, 
quick garden, quick gardens give me a, a, a good service and a little bit cheaper than the a little bit cheaper than the buildings that are in Dobies. And I'm not sure, I'd like to go back to Dobies and just see the quality that's in Dobies Garden Centre to see if the quality is the same. But um, uh, they, were, they were much cheaper than the Doby buildings. And I couldn't find a Dobies building that would give me a three by three um, uh, starting point as the viewing area. And quick gardens were uh, easily, uh, could easily change their plans to what I wanted and not a prefabricated construction that had to be a particular area. Just as we were ordered the equipment, just as it was about to be delivered, we discovered that although we'd got a unconditional planning application approval, we had to have a building warrant. So another month's delay, more drawings, building warrant came and everything was fine after that. The, appl the application now was on an agricultural field, hence, hence the reason for requiring a planning application and not just, uh, 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 it wasn't in a back garden, it was in an agricultural field, hence the reason for the uh, change of land use, and as well as providing us with an area to put the observatory on, the landowner said, it's a low risk floodplain, I don't want you to put in an application without lifting the ground up a bit, um, and I'll provide you with the stone to do it. So 200 tonne of stone arrived, from the develop from the landowner, and the mound, uh, the, the and you can hopefully you could see a mound just in the foreground. But we did entrust the foundation to a builder in Moffat. He put in a foundation course, and I said, "Lift it up. We're going to lift the telescope up a bit." So um, our meter cube of concrete, which sometimes appears as a buried item in the ground, we've lifted it up and it's attached to the foundation of the concrete building. So it, it's on complete casting. And the pier for the telescope will go on the top of this uh, concrete block. While we were waiting for the building warrant to come in, the material was delivered. And you can see it here on the right hand side in one very large package, three tons of wood in this. And it's all packed up together. And we had to sit like that and wait for our building warrant to say, yes, you can go ahead. That was another month's delay, total frustration. Well, when we started taking the cover off, we discovered all the bits were higgledy piggledy. But the, the, the designers had given me a plan to work with. Every piece of timber had a label on it, and each wall had a particular uh, index. It was A, B, C, or D, or E, F, and whatever wall had a, a letter and then there was timber and each piece of timber had a label on it to say it goes that wall and that piece of timber but it was all rumbled up all jumbled up and the very bits we needed first were guess where right down at the bottom supporting the pallet <laughs> and are creating the pallet the hardwood that goes between the concrete base and the first part of soft timber right at the bottom. Having unpacked it all, and in the quietness of an empty field, I put together the plan. I laid out where the hardwood was going to go to give the dimensions. And I, with a red marker jet, I labeled every wall with an A, B, C, or D. And I put down the the, the timber numbers by the side of it. As well as that, I put samples of the timber that was needed to go close to where they were going to go in the assembled bit. 
to me, I was putting the picture together for, for me as well as the club members who were ready to jump together. And you may well say, well, why didn't you get somebody to build it for you? It would have been dead simple to get someone in and just say, just get on with it. Well, um, I did say that the club, it's a club enterprise. Um, once we've got completed, the club members can say they've achieved something. Had we had the builder do it, dead simple, it would be not without any problems. Well, what I wasn't, what I wasn't ready for when the gangers arrived were the questions. I thought I would be helping them put the things together, but I couldn't do anything but stand and answer questions. Jim, where does this bit of wood go? Jim, this bit of wood's the wrong way. Uh, this bit of wood doesn't fit. Yeah, turn it round the other way. Well, uh, turn it round, he turned it round the other way, he turned it upside down, and the tongues, instead of going up, were then going down. I, no, 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 turn it 180 degrees the other way round. You know, um, Jim, this bit of wood's got a warp. Okay, put it to the side, warped wood to that side, and put another bit in. We'll leave the warped wood to the end. And it just went on and on. It was really, I, I, I should have been ready for it. And, yeah, it was just marvellous, actually, just to see them just getting on with it. In spite of the fact that I put red markers all over the place, still needed help to put it together. But within hours, we were then starting to put the walls up. And you can see how the timber is interlocking uh, uh, and the meeting room to one side, the observing room to the far end. And the windows, the windows came, we'll come back to windows in a minute. The windows came prefabricated in a frame with glass in it, um, simple. Um, just lifted them into place and put the face here on the front, face here on the back, and that was the windows fixed in place. And the door as well. And it took three days to get to the point at which we could put a roof on the five by three meeting area. The club chairman now of the time said, it's going to take three months to build this. And I said, no, we'll have the roof on in three days. And I achieved it. So as well as, well as my six months for Moffat, um, uh, what I thought was six months, um, I achieved. Although it took five years to get to the end, I think we'll find that it's taken another five years to get to the position we're in today. However, the dome arrived and it's now getting in towards December and weather's really getting not too good. And we decided again, we've got some money to buy, the, buy a, a, a dome and we'll put, get the manufacturers to put this dome in place on our flat roof of the observing section. So they came from south of England somewhere, um, Pulsar uh, came and put the put the dome up, a short wall on top of the flat roof, and then the dome on top of the little short wall. And the lifted itch bit into sections, helped them hold it in place while they were bolted it all up. And uh, within half a day or more, we now had a building that was beginning to look like an observatory. But there's always, a, there's always a but, isn't there? But um, we discovered after they'd gone that um, some of the short wall didn't really touch the flat roof. Uh, so the answer to that was stick some uh, glue, filler, um, silicon filler. Several tubes of silicon filler later, we had it sealed off. First shower of rain, in came water. Ah. So next stage was to put a rubber EDPM sheet on top of that. Great, we thought, and seal it round the edge with mastic sealer. Still water found its way in. 
And then we discovered an eyelid deficiency. At this time, I'm not sure if those of you who have got eyelid or have opened them. Whilst we were able to buy a motor which rotated the dome, we weren't, didn't have enough money to have an eyelid motor. So we had to pull a cord to open and shut the eyelid. Well, once the eyelid gets to about halfway, it's fine. And you think, oh, this is easy now. It's e difficult to lift it up. Halfway, easy. Well, you just let it go and it crashes backwards. Well, uh, this eyelid crashed so badly backwards. The only way you could pull it up was to go outside and push it back up out of its jammed position. So I uh, phoned up Pulsar and said, uh, there's a deficiency with the buffers. We've got a buffer that stops it. When it shuts, there's a buffer on the shutting edge, but we're needing a buffer for the opening edge. Oh, we've never been asked for that before, but I uh, eventually got one. And, we, and there's two buffers now to stop it crashing backwards. But the really annoying part of it was COVID is starting to set in and also three months of really wet weather. At some stage, I was in tears because there was so much water, even although it was covered in a tarpaulin, there was holes starting to come in the tarpaulin and we're getting water in most places. Really depressing, however. Once the rain disappeared, we then started playing around with the motorized dome. And the di we discovered that whilst the dome rotated in one direction quite easily, it wouldn't rotate properly in the other direction. The manufacturers didn't show us it going round in both directions. They demonstrated it going round one way, said the bumps would disappear eventually, but they didn't. So we had to have them back again. And you can see the position, they were nice, all the joints were nicely camouflaged with tape. Uh, so when we'd identified where it was sticking, uh, we took the tape off and we discovered the picture on the right. So the manufacturers were asked to come back again and sort it. So I did say I'd come back to Windows. Whilst there may well have been design deficiencies as far as the dome was concerned, we discovered one or two deficiencies with the cabin itself. The, interlo the interlocking timber uh, was, had its own movement. Although we, were, although we were locked down and could do no movement, the weather, it was moving quite a bit, expanding and contracting. And it expanded and contracted at the different time to the window frame. So I had, it was allowing water because it was just a fascia that held, two fascias that held the window frame in place, window frame here, two fascias. The water was running down in behind the fascia and getting into the cabin. So I designed an overlapping joint so the window frame could move up and down at a different rate to the wall movement. I also added a drip edge. Wheelchair ramp, courtesy of Sir Alfred McAlpine, we provided, because it's up on a, a, a mound, a, about a metre up above the ground level, roughly, um, we have a wheelchair access a ramp for wheelchairs and steps for others, all provided by courtesy of Alfred McAlpine with planings from the motorway, which is just adjacent, because he's got the contract to maintain the motorway past Moffat. And they've got a community service where they provide a certain amount of free material and labor and plant to do access construction for community, improved accesses for community. So courtesy of Alfred McAlpine, we got a set of steps and a ramp to get up into the observatory. So wheelchairs can get up into the warm room area. They can't go up into the telescope area, unfortunately, but the plan is 
to get information transferred from the telescope into the warm area so that we can look at pictures in the eyepiece on a screen in the warm room for those who are disabled. And you can see in within half, of, this photograph is only half the warm room area, the seating area for four or five in here. So you could have four or five in here while there's two or three in the observing section, which is up the stairs just beyond the door. And the steps up into the uh, observing section has a little feature which are designed so that you don't fall down the steps in the darkness while you're engrossed in looking through the telescope. There's a little trap door to shut and save you falling down the steps, hopefully. And we have at last, we've got the telescope. It arrived late and it's a, it's a mid, um, it's a mid, it's a 16 inch telescope. Uh, 16 inch mid, but it's on an ioptron mount, uh, SEM120 equatorial mount, equatorial mount, so that we can provide future uh, camera work as far as the uh, uh, telescope's concerned. And the camera work transfers, as well as transferring images onto uh, a laptop, they could be seen by uh, say a wheelchair bound person in the warm room. But it's also got Wi-Fi facilities on it, like, a bit like Bluetooth, and as well as a hand controlled go-to arrangement, we can couple into that with an iPad with something like Sky Safari. Although at the moment we're having problems coupling in Sky Safari, it has um, uh, some into, some interconnection isn't working properly. But the idea is that a disabled person with an iPad in the warm room could operate the telescope. And better still, someone in the school, hopefully, could perhaps operate the telescope without needing to come out of the schoolroom if they want to do it that way. We've bought, as well as a 40 mil, 22 mil, and a 14 mil eyepiece. We've got cameras for both the eyepiece and the finder scope so that we've got facilities in the future for auto guiding and picture, res picture correct collection later on. There's no mains electricity on site. Um, there's no running water either. But most of the equipment is powered by 12 volt material, 12 volt DC. Telescope is operated with, with 12 volts. The mount is in 12 volts. Um, the, the rotating dome is 240 volts, but could be worked with 12 volts with a connection. So we decided that solar power was going to be the prime mover as far as electricity was concerned. We did buy a portable generator just in case, but we can provide 240 volts at a low power for charging up laptops and things like that with an inverter, which is fed off 12 volts. So whilst we've got a 12 volt within the observing section, we can put two 40 volt sockets in the warm area. And you'll no stranger to this part of the country is Professor Catherine Hamans came and opened the observatory for us in October last year. So all in all, from my throwaway statement and mustard seed, it took 10 years to get from, it's a bridge too far for Dumfries and Galloway Council to this point. And you know, I didn't have, in my vision, I didn't have 10 years later vision in mind. 
as I said at the star party, it might be the end of the story for me as an engineer. I didn't realize that that mustard seed could grow this far. And you know, it's still growing because we've got plans to increase the mound. We've got plans to increase the mound a little bit further so that we could provide a flat area in which anyone who wants to look outside on a nice night could go outside with binoculars or their, perhaps their own telescope. And they've got an area to look at outside. And not only that, we're saying perhaps we need a manager. And that's just going out that little bit further. So while I say it's still growing, I don't know how far it's going to grow to. So I think you'll realize that I moved back to Scotland in 2008, round about the traditional retiring age. I can tell you that it's 15 years since I moved to Scotland, but in the 14 Dark Sky Award areas that I've been working in, um, you know, it's given me 15 years of added life. Um, um, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. There's been sad bits. There's been really difficult bits. But mostly, I've enjoyed the challenge of putting my words together and the idea saying, yes, that's all right. Whilst they have come up with a completely different set of words to start with, we have managed to join UK English with American English. And um, perhaps it is maybe time for my final retirement and, um, and spend more time looking at Moffat and expanding Moffat as a, an attraction. Um, and I, I forgot to say at the beginning, I've actually got two more slides to show if we've got time to do it, but it's about lighting. And I said to Nigel earlier on, I don't want to, uh, I could spend all day talking about lighting. Um, your interest is in Moffat. And if I start talking about lighting, it will lose the impact of Moffat. Um, but it relates to lighting and white light. But if I, um, if I just finish at this point, um, I, I will. I don't know how long you've got, but if I finish at this point and say thanks for listening to me, uh, I, if I get questions on white light, I may well show you two other, three other slides. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you don't want to finish quite yet, then there's a good job for you in Edinburgh trying to get us a, a Dark Sky Award in Edinburgh. <laughs> I think that might be a bit more challenging. Um, that was really good, thank you. Um, I have a Pulsar Dome and I recognize all the problems you had. I'm still chasing leaks in that as well. So thank you. Um, have we got any questions in the, in the whole festival? And if you're on Zoom or YouTube, put, put it in the chat, please. Have you got some, Nigel? Thanks very much, Jim. That was a, a fascinating talk. Um, and it, how, how much use does the, the new observatory get? I mean, is it common on a, a clear night for several club members to be up there using it? Uh, is, and is it used continuously? Uh, for instance, do they, do they use it for club meetings as well as observing? Uh, the answer to that is no, we've not got club nights and very few club members have been to it. But I can tell you that We've got a, a website in which you can actually book your night and more visitors have been to the observatory than club members. So uh, it's, it's certainly not a club telescope. Um, uh, there's maybe been one or two hiccups in, on the website and folks haven't been able to book properly. But the whole idea <laughs> is that it's a community observatory and not limited to club members only. And I think it was the fact that we advertised it as a community observatory that attracted Scottish and Southern energy 
to say, this is a good idea. We've never had an idea like this before. And I think it was its uniqueness and the way it was presented. I didn't do the application, by the way. That was done completely uh, from the club committee. Um, uh, and and I, say, I used the word brainstorming, but you know, I think it was a bit volatile at times with everybody trying to put their bit of ounce. Uh, and, and I do know we, we finally bought a 16 inch telescope. You know, we spent hours wondering whether we should have a 14 inch or a 16 inch. We've had, we had enough money, money in the budget for a 14 inch. And there was others saying, no, we've got to go one stage further. We have to have a 16 inch. You know, and yeah, it's worked out fine. We've, and actually, in fact, we've, we've still got some money left. Um, the second, tele, we had money set aside for a second telescope. Some of that has been used up, but not all of it. So there's, there's that little bit more. But certainly, it's a, we've, we're trying to make it a community observatory and not a club observatory. Thank you very much. Any questions for Andy? And we have two honorary presidents. This is our other one, by the way. <laughs> uh, hi. So um, what about those 24 school pupils who uh, wrote you the letter? Uh, the letters. Uh, are, are they still involved? Have they been to the observatory? Is, do you linking up with um, Moffat Academy to um, do interesting projects? Yes, we have. In an actual fact, you know, one of the students who wrote the letter is now at the stage where he's leaving school and heading for St Andrews to study astronomy uh, as part of his his degree, physics and uh, astro astrophysics. I'm not really quite sure the whole subject, but he's heading in the direction, uh, and that was from um, uh, one, as well as we've the science physics teacher. The physics teacher is actually a member of the club, so we've got a, a connection. The club has got a connection to the school in more than just an indirect fashion. Um, uh, the, the mammoth light table that had all of the numbers in it, how much time does it take to gather all that information? Is it just yourself with a light meter on a stick running around the town taking numbers or, you know, how much help do you get to sort of build up that picture? Because it was kind of fun just to see a snapshot of it. But um, when you're talking about how much light is wasted by different fittings, for example, who is it that's doing those measurements? Is it all coming from yourself or have you got a, a team of people that have done the work and, you know, how long does it take? Um, I don't know how many hours it took, uh, it, but it was great to do. It, it was just a challenge as far as I was concerned. I, it was a challenge as far as I was concerned. I have software. Uh, 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 being a lighting engineer, I've got software to do the calculations for me. I could set up my grids myself. It's not an it's not a normal it's not an or normal exercise to calculate light in people's gardens or on building faces. So I set up the grids. I more modified the software to do it. Build up my own grids, and as although I only show four, although I think I only showed four different manufacturers. I think it was more like 10 different manufacturers that I tried. But having, having, having set it up as a baseline, having set the streets up as a baseline, that was the difficult bit. All you need to do is to plug in, in turn, take, take away the high pressure, take away the sodium fitting and put in another one. And you get exactly the same geometry and you can then compare the results that you get from that geometry, bring in another manufacturer, put one away, bring in another one. So it was the difficult bit, the hardest bit was actually setting up the baseline to it. Yeah. So it's mostly done in the software then, so you're not running around a town with the light meters no. and things. In. Okay, only, just run <laughs> only run around with the sky quality meter. Um, when do we do that? Um, 
I forgot where. Yeah, part way through the part way through. Once once I got once I got everything in place, we went ran round by a sky quality meter, picking up the darkest areas, uh, and the best input. Uh, the, it went from something like nineteen to twenty on the sky quality meter at one per, one place in the town centre went from 19 to 20. And the rest of the area around about is round about the 20, the high 20 point somethings, not too many at 21s. Uh, uh, but the sky quality, the sky quality meter, something different from a light meter. I didn't do any light meters. I used the computer to give me the results from a computer. Then it's based on one particular, you see that? That's then based on one particular exercise and not varying with different site conditions. It's much more, much more, I'll call it theoretic, much more theoretical than practical. Yeah. Any other questions in the room, Ramsey? I, I had a look at the astronomy, uh, Moffat Astronomy website a few weeks ago, and I noticed that you had some uh, piers dotted around the town uh, for use by other astronomers. Do those have to be booked in advance or are they just turn up and use them? Uh, I'm not quite sure I heard, but you don't need to be on You don't need to no, be. No, no, it was, it was piers yeah. rather than going to the astronomy dome. I noticed that there was a pier beside the wildlife area just as you come into Moffat from the BTIC side. Uh, I'm, I'm having difficulty hearing what you're saying. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, uh -huh. Oh, the piers round the town. No, you don't need to book the piers round the town. Um, there are three piers round the town. Um, and they're there for anyone to use. Um, one thing we are short of, though, uh, uh, and I, I thought it was on the website, are, the, are, the, are those points. Are those points on the website? There are, I definitely saw some, yes. Right, you don't need to book those. You just need to book the time for the observatory. And then they've got someone like myself or two other members. Uh, we've been pushed into uh, escorting people around the telescope. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm a lighty. I'm the lowest at the moment. I'm, I'm the reserve. As a lighty engineer, I'm learning as I go along. There's one or two... Um, thoroughly thoroughly versed on the stars and the sky and the telescope. Um, and they are the sort of leaders for the Monday or the Thursday or whatever it is, time slot. Um, and I think we've actually got two, one for uh, uh, beginners and one for uh, early. I, I don't think we've got a time slot for advanced yet. I don't think we're, I don't think we're that far advanced for advanced work which is what I thought you were asking. But I do know there was a problem on the website where some people weren't able to book. And I don't know what happened, but we got, I shouldn't, I maybe shouldn't say this. Uh, I maybe, uh, yeah, well, uh, we got on Facebook, um, we got criticism that, um, why are visitors not getting in to see the, the is this um, club, uh, club domination of uh, the, the telescope usage, far from it. As I've said earlier, there are far more visitors using the telescope than there are club members. So Facebook, uh, I, I hope you put that in. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are there any um, questions on um, Zoom? Uh, Radam, you? Yes, there is one message and one question. First of all, thank you very much for the great talk. It was a very interesting journey. And Susan says, thank you for an interesting talk. You have given me hope as I have a street light directly outside my house. So that was from Susan. And Horst is asking, 
Can we see the two slides on lightning? Okay. Uh, this will this will come as a surprise to you. Um, when I moved to the Midlands, um, I found that there was one of the cities in the Midlands which had a white light policy. His main roads were lit with fully cut off lighting, which is what the IDA are looking for at the moment, fully cut off, all the light coming down and white. Um, and you'll notice from this photograph, it's white light, it's glare free, there's good uniformity in the highway surface, and it would have been a perfect example to show the Dark Sky Association, but they didn't exist in 1970. Uh, and I'm going to show you the same road the next. But the mid 70s crisis, I had to look on as the manager with the purse strings say to the manager of the white light maintenance, say, there's not enough money in the budget to run high wattage white light. And you'll see at the top, 400 watts of white light, 135 watts of sodium light. At that time, lighting design was based on illumens being equal. The design spacing was based, based on a spacing of columns depended on the road width and the height the column was, assuming that the lumens were about the same. And you see in this sodium lighting producing about 22,000 lumens, on the right hand side, white light producing 25,000 lumens. White light incidentally having a color temperature at that time of 4,000 Kelvin. But you can see from the camera work that the light on, yeah, all right, I've jumped a bit. Um, the manager of the white light eventually got to the stage said, okay, I'll need to change to low pressure sodium, much to his um, aggravation. And also mine too, uh, because I was asked early on what I thought of the lighting, as we saw in the white light. And I said, the road's fine, but it's a bit gloomy in the background. Well, you can see the error in the ways. At that time, white light was providing a lot better uniformity and clarity as far as vision's concerned. And it was wrong to put in low pressure sodium on the same lumen basis. That was in the mid fifties. Cameras don't lie. And the eye that you see, hopefully you can see both screens, yes. Um, hopefully you could see in one, is a well-lit road and the other one isn't, yeah? I only wish I had seen those pictures earlier on. I didn't get this picture till well, well into my career, possibly uh, towards the, uh, nearing the end of my time in Coventry. Uh, I, and I think if I had been given this as a new, as a new engineer, as an engineer at that time, I said, quite incorrectly, is resisting change because he's old. Yeah. Now I'm an oldie geriatric. Um, I just hope that somebody, in, a, a, new, a new engineer, doesn't just go along and say, is a geriatric resisting change. But you know, there's, had I seen those, this picture, earlier in life, I think I would have changed my tune a little bit. And it's because of sodium providing that, things have changed through the time into the 80s and 90s, design work changed, design work was then based on computer predictions of illumination values. It wasn't a recipe table to look up anymore. And that's why we finished up with 
yellow mound of light everywhere because the illumination levels using sodium just went up and up and up and up. And as you saw in the table, 7% of that was going up into the sky when it should really have been pointing downwards. Yeah. Remember, folks, um, light pollution, light is not a pollutant. It's the particles of dust and moisture in the atmosphere. We use light pollution today as if it was just like the, the way we use hoovers, even although a hoover, a, a vacuum cleaner could be a hoover or a Dyson, but we still call it hoovers. Light pollution is more in the particles of moisture and particles in the air. Light is invisible. But we have to grow the dark sky work outwards. Can't stop. There's no sense in going straight into the center of Edinburgh and saying, I'm going to convert everything in the center of Edinburgh. Has to start and work from the dark sky areas inwards and preserving the dark sky areas before we start killing off and light pollution in centers. Okay, thank you very much on that. Is there anything on YouTube? Oh, I hope the I hope the member in Germany. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, that was a um, fantastic presentation there, um, James. Just to say, one of our furthest viewers was away in Kalamazoo in Michigan, so uh, <laughs> we watched all the way from there. Um, just um, a question here, um, thinking about regulations and stuff, um, I've spent a bit of time in France and France is really big on its dark sky site and they're bringing in regulations and laws and you need planning permission for lighting above certain lumens and all this kind of stuff. Do you see this coming into the UK, into Scotland in the future or do you see it as a very slow thing that's going to happen? I know you've put me on the spot. I'm a lighting engineer. I like flexibility. I like working with sustainable, uh, sustainable, I like working in sustainable exercises. Remember I'd said to you, um, I'd written the first with a great deal of passion. I think by the time what uh, the manager was saying to me was, it's not a sustainable document. You shall not do this and you shall not do that. That is American basis. Um, but yeah, I think we should be able to come to a happy, a happy medium between the two. Um, even British standards, British standards uh, and other guidance notes are based on recommendations of good practice. We've now got what's called the all party parliamentary group. And they're starting to look at ways of um, maybe putting a bit more regulation into lighting design. I'm not sure how far they've gone. I did volunteer my services to join the group, but that got a zero response. So um, I'm, 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 not into, <laughs> I'm not into the whole party parliamentary group, but they should, be working, they should be working in line with local authorities. And I'm an engineer, and I used to think that engineers had the answer to dark sky work. I think, I may have to change my tune a little bit and say planners have the key for dark sky work. It's sometimes the planners that pass documents which are sometimes a bit askew as far as trying to be dark sky friendly. And I think it's at the planning stage that we may well see a little bit more regulation. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Can we thank Jim again for his talk? Thank you. Okay, we have um, Nigel's going to give us a, a talk about the sky in it's June, isn't it? Yes, it is June. Yeah, plug again.
Sorry about this, we'll go with you in a second. So thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to uh, whiz through uh, the presentation on the, the, the sky in, in June, and uh, I'll, I'll open my presentation with a, a, a wonderful image from uh, Andrew of uh, a, a meteorite. Uh, if only the star, if only the skies were that dark uh, in in uh, in this month of June. But uh, it was just such a striking image. I, I felt I, I would have to use it as my opening slide. So let's take a look at the sky in June 2022. Well, the first thing to say about the, the, the sky uh, in June in any year is that uh, there is a, a distinct lack of darkness. And uh, I think that's uh, quite well shown by Fran's image here of the, uh, the uh, a phenomenon known as the, the, the belt of Venus, uh, which occurs um, uh, I think uh, through the summer and perhaps all year round, where you get this rosy glow on the opposite side of the horizon from the setting sun. And I think also in terms of the rising sun. So this is a view taken out over uh, Berwick Law. But uh, I, ch I chose this image because it gives an idea uh, of the kind of level of, of light that you experience at this time of year. Uh, well into the 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 the, the, the late uh, evening, and also to some extent into the small hours of the the following morning. So the the uh, the twenty first of June is the is the summer solstice, uh, where we have uh, the the shortest nights and the longest days. And uh, at ten fourteen British summer time, the sun will reach its most most northerly position in the sky. And astronomical darkness, which is the darkness that most of us are, are interested in, especially those of us who are observing and, and imaging uh, dark sky objects, uh, astronomical darkness is what we want, but unfortunately it's absent uh, over the whole of the, the UK. And uh, the ephemeris for the sun, uh, at least for the first 10 days of June, just to illustrate this um, uh, quite nicely, so we, uh, fr from the, the 2nd of June onwards and through the whole of June and into July, um, really, uh, uh, once we get come out of civil twilight, uh, where the sun is between, uh, is, has just set and, and is about six degrees, down to six degrees below the horizon, um, you, uh, you're then moving into nautical twilight when it moves between six and 12 degrees below the horizon. Uh, and nautical twilight, as you can see, is stretching through the entire night. So what to do about this? Well, all is not lost. Um, we uh, have a, a phenomenon which occurs uh, in June and July uh, called uh, noctilucent clouds. And uh, we were just coming in now to the noctilucent cloud season, noctilucent meaning night shining. Uh, and these clouds are uh, quite spectacular to see. They're, they, they, they're reasonably, uh, you can see them reasonably often in June and July, but otherwise they, they tend to be rather rare. And these are caused um, by ice crystals, clouds of ice crystals, very, very high up in the, in the atmosphere, perhaps about 82 kilometers up. And these are being lit by the sun, which although it's below the horizon, uh, the, its light is still reflecting from these uh, ice crystals because they're so high up. And uh, they, they, they can be confused with uh, other cloud phenomenon, but I think once you get your eye in, as Ramsey has here with this wonderful uh, image over Edinburgh, uh, they're, they're quite unmistakable. So they're, they're, they're quite a, a, a nice thing to look out for at this time of year. And you'll, you'll be able to see them usually 90 to 120 minutes after sunset on the, the northwest horizon or before sunrise on the northeast horizon. It's also a good time to 
uh, at this time of year to observe the sun, although looking at the weather we've had today, you wouldn't necessarily believe that. Um, but uh, we are now in solar cycle uh, 25. This is uh, an 11 year cycle, uh, which we've been uh, recording and observing uh, for the last 25 years. So that we're, 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 uh, we've recorded 25 cycles of the sun. So this is solar cycle 25. And uh, from this little montage produced by, by Mark, uh, you can see that uh, the, the sun is a, a fascinating target uh, for, for astronomy. Um, and th this is a little set of, of eight uh, images showing the progression and development of a, a group of sunspots across the, the face of the sun. And it just illustrates the kind of thing that you, you can do providing you have the right equipment because uh, this is the, the health warning. I'm not going to insult anybody's uh, in, in intelligence by putting red words across my, my presentation, but you must never look at the sun with the unaided eye or especially through any kind of optical instrument unless it is properly shielded. But if you have the proper equipment, the sun is a, a, a fascinating uh, target to look at. And uh, hopes are high for a lot of activity on, on the sun. Uh, for the last wee while, it's been rather bald. Um, but uh, if you can see from this uh, diagram that uh, we are actually, the, the amount of, of sunspots is exceeding expectations uh, as things stand at the moment in this year. And if it carries on going the way it's going, we should have actually a, a, a quite a nice uh, amount of activity on the sun up until about 2025, 26, before the, the cycle starts to drop off again. So what of the, the deep sky? Well, as I've already explained, um, because of the, the, the lack of, of darkness, um, uh, deep sky objects are perhaps a, a very difficult target to get at, but they can still be uh, got at. Um, what uh, uh, what we can look for are, are faint objects with a high surface uh, brightness uh, that make them a bit easy, easier to observe. And uh, that can include uh, star clusters, both open star clusters and globular star clusters. And as we know, uh, not all globular clusters look the same. So there's, there's plenty of variety out there. Uh, we can also, and this is a, an example here of, of M3, Messier 3 in Canis Venatici, uh, taken by Mark. We can also look for some, some of the brighter galaxies. Uh, some of them have quite a high surface brightness. And for astrophotographers, they can still be a rewarding target, even though it's relatively uh, light nights. And we can also take a look for some of the brighter nebulae uh, uh, emission nebulae and reflection nebulae. So let's take a look through, uh, a quick look through the, the, the constellations that are prominent uh, over this, uh, this coming month. So if we look to the east, um, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is the, the situation uh, at uh, midnight, uh, British summertime uh, on the 16th of June, more or less the middle of the month. And we can see that uh, looking east, uh, that uh, Cygnus is, is becoming uh, more prominent, uh, along with Lyra and a, uh, Aquila uh, and a number of other constellations uh, off to the, the southeast there. Uh, of Euchus is, is, is also in place. Um, but what you'll notice uh, uh, straight away for, for those of us who are stargazers is the, the summer triangle, uh, the, the line between Deneb um, in Cygnus, uh, Vega in Lyra, and Altair in Aquila. And that forms uh, what is known as the, the, the summer triangle. And once you, once you see it, even in a fairly uh, heavily light, uh, 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 light covered uh, area, you can still see these are all quite bright stars. So, you, so you, once you pick up this triangle, and it is quite a big asterism, you, you, you quite often can't miss it anymore. And within uh, Cygnus, uh, we've got uh, um, 
uh, uh, targets like the, the Vale Nebula, both the Eastern Vale and the Western Vale, and this is an, a nice image from Greg Loudon, um, which have a relatively high uh, brightness and given the right conditions could be, could be quite easily uh, picked up. And uh, another little target in Lyra, uh, uh, quite close to the, the bright star Vega, uh, is uh, M57, the, 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 the ring nebula, which is a planetary nebula, and is a rewarding target uh, with the right equipment. So turning uh, clockwise uh, to look south, um, we are we're picking up again uh, Ophiuchus, sorry, I've said Ophiuchus, didn't I? So Ophiuchus, I'm trying to get my pronunciations right, um, is, is, is prominent as is Virgo. A bit higher up in the sky, we have uh, Buetes and uh, Arcturus um, and some other constellations which I'll be speaking about uh, in, in a moment. But within this area of sky, um, we've got, uh, especially in Ophiuchus, we have no less than seven uh, Messier objects, which are star clusters, uh, M9 uh, uh, through to 12, and M14, 19, 62, and 107, which are all star clusters uh, and make good targets. We also have uh, a, a nice, uh, I think it's an emission nebulae, um, a, a IC 4603 and 4604. And we can see those here. So that's a, a, a picture by Mark again of uh, Messier 12. And turning around again to our right, uh, looking over to the west, um, some of the constellations of the winter are starting to disappear. Leo is still evident, but, but is getting lower in the sky. Ursa Major is, is high up, um, uh, and uh, we've got uh, Canis Venatici is another prominent uh, 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 constellation in this direction. And this is the, the Black Eye Galaxy, uh, uh, pictured by Andrew again, M M Messier 64. And the, the Needle Galaxy, uh, uh, also in Canis Venatici from Pat Devine. And then coming right round uh, to the north, uh, we can look at uh, Camelo Pardalis uh, and Cassiopeia are uh, prominent uh, constellations along with Cepheus, which are all rich hunting grounds for deep sky objects. For example, the, the, the Heart Nebula, uh, it's a nice uh, monochrome image from Eros Tang. And uh, an open cluster this time, Mark does like his clusters, uh, the Owl Cluster in Cassiopeia. I think both of those uh, 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 targets are in Cassiopeia. And if we look straight up, we've got uh, all of the circumpolar uh, constellations to play with um, uh, just by, by uh, look, lifting our heads up to the zenith. Uh, and within that, uh, we've got the, uh, the Iris Nebula, uh, which is quite a large, bright nebula in Cepheus. And uh, a favourite of mine, uh, a nice image here from Mike McGovern of uh, Messier 51 in Canis Venatici, the Whirlpool uh, uh, Galaxy. So let's uh, move on then to the, the Moon. And these are the phases for, for June. Uh, we've, the first quarter comes to us uh, on the 7th of June. Uh, the, uh, the full moon is on the 14th. Uh, the third quarter on the 20th and the new moon on the 28th, uh, the, towards the end of the month. The, we, we have a uh, a supermoon coming up on the uh, 14th of the month uh, at 12.52 British summertime. And here's a nice image from Bill uh, Boner of uh, a full moon. And it's all to do, the supermoon effect is all to do with apogee and perigee. 
So uh, the moon has a slightly elliptical orbit. So uh, when it's at apogee, it's farthest from the Earth and has an apparent size of 30 arc minutes. Uh, at perigee, when it's closest to the Earth, it has an apparent size of 34 arc minutes. So it, it uh, uh, looks larger. And it, it does actually look, you know, when you're looking at it, it can look uh, considerably larger. But this whole effect is, is uh, made more prominent uh, by uh, the full moon illusion uh, when the moon is near the horizon. I'm sure we've all seen it. So when you combine uh, the, uh, the moon at perigee with uh, when it's just rising or setting, um, it appears to be enormous, uh, which is, is not really... Uh, it's it's not swollen to huge proportions. It just looks that way because of the amount of atmosphere that you're looking through. But uh, on the 14th of June, uh, if the moon is visible, if clouds are not in the way, uh, when it's rising and setting, you will see this full moon illusion of a, of a giant moon. So the planets and the moon will the moon will play a bit of a, a part in the planets this month as well as we'll see as we go through the planets. The planets uh, during June are uh, morning objects. Uh, so if you're somebody that's able to get out of his bed early or stay up late, uh, that's the best time to see them. Uh, around about uh, 0400 uh, British summer time in, in most cases. And this is a, a, a very nice image uh, recently taken by Mike McGovern of Jupiter, which was a daylight image, but it just gives you uh, some idea of what can be done when there's plenty of light around, even with the planets. So Venus uh, on the 30th of June, towards the end of the, the month, uh, is low in the east northeast, rises about 100 minutes before sunrise. And this is, a, a, again, another health warning. Um, if you're absorbed either photographing or observing the planets in the early morning, you've always got to be aware of when sunrise is coming along because you can be just, it's, it would be all too easy to inadvertently um, uh, have the sun come into your, your field of view. And it's uh, uh, like, uh, as we'll see going through the, the planets in June, uh, the Venus is close to a waning crescent moon on the morning of the 26th. So for wide field photographers, it might be quite an interesting uh, image to go for. Mercury on 30th of June, very low in the northeast, uh, rises about 70 minutes this time before sunrise. Uh, it's magnitude uh, minus 0.6. And Mercury is a, a devilishly difficult target to, to, to see an object to observe because obviously it's so close to the sun. Uh, on this occasion, it's close to the waning moon again, so it might be uh, you might be able to use the the moon as a signpost to to finding Mercury, even if you just want to say you've seen it. Mars uh, is about twenty two degrees up in the east southeast. Uh, through a telescope, it will, it will show a gibbous phase, and again, it will be close to the waning crescent moon on the twenty second, twenty third. So uh, you should be able to find that relatively easily. It's magnitude uh, plus uh, 0.5 and about seven arc seconds across by the end of the month. Saturn, uh, it feels like a long time since we've had a good view of Saturn and it is. And uh, you, it's to be found in the south, uh, uh, brightening slightly from plus 0.8 to 0.7. And again, it's near the moon on the 18th, uh, and it's rising steadily. Uh, it'll be over 20 degrees altitude in the south uh, by, the, by the month's end. However, for, for those that are uh, photographing it, uh, the, the, the aspect of, of Saturn when seen from the Earth uh, means that the rings are beginning to close now. Uh, they've been very open uh, over the last uh, couple of years. And that's a, a nice image uh, by Radum uh, of, of Saturn, uh, taken, uh, seems like ages ago, but uh, it's, uh, it's a nice image to, to, to go with. And Jupiter uh, is in the southeast, close to Mars on the 1st of June, uh, and near the moon again uh, on the 21st and 22nd. So the planets uh, and the moon are kind of marching hand in hand through the month. Uh, for those of us who are uh, very keen, uh, the moon uh, on the 19th of, of the month 
uh, is going to occult a, a tenth magnitude star, the attractively named TYC 3-478-1, which is in Pisces. Um, once, it, once the moon rises, it will have already occulted that star, but it should pop back into view uh, from behind Saturn at about, uh, well, probably exactly at 0248 British summertime. So if you've got, if you've got Jupiter in view uh, and you, you're, you're able to look for that, uh, that's a nice uh, occultation to, to look for. Uh, Uranus and Neptune, not really observable uh, this month. Comets, uh, we've really only got one comet, which is worth noting in June this year, uh, and that is a uh, pan stars. Uh, these are images, this is an image taken by Horst uh, of pan stars uh, back uh, in 2013. And another, another image I was able to find on the uh, the, the website uh, from Peter Black of, of Pan Stars. Um, I don't think it's it's going to be particularly bright, but it should be a, a telescope, a telescopic object, because it's brightening from uh, plus 8.8 .8 to 8.1. Uh, unfortunately, the sky is brightening through the month as well, so that, that may not help. Um, whether it gets any brighter, who knows? Um, that's the whole thing about comets. Uh, it's to be found again in Ophiuchus, starting three degrees east of 72 Ophiuchi and tracking southwest. Uh, it will be near the southern edge of IC 4665 on the 20th and 22nd and close to Beta Ophiuchi on the 21st, 23rd. And that's me finished, so thank you very much.